Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the August Comte Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name is Nikhil Venkatesh. I'm a fellow here in the Department of Philosophy, Logic, and Scientific Method. And our speaker tonight is Joseph Heath, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto and Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Um, so after my introduction, Joe's going to talk uh, until about half seven, after which we'll then have uh, a Q&A where you can put questions to Joe based on what you've heard in the talk. Um, tonight's event is being broadcast online, so welcome to all of our online viewers. Um, and it will also be recorded as a podcast and video, which we disseminated through LSE channels. So just a little bit about this lecture series. Uh, it's named after Auguste Comte, uh, a French philosopher of the 19th century. Comte was a founder of the positivist movement, which, amongst other things, placed scientific observation at the centre of a theory of social development. Positivism was a major influence on the British Fabian Society um, of the late 19th century, and the Fabians ultimately were the founders of the London School of Economics. Our institution retains a vaguely positivist streak. So at the Department of Philosophy, Logic, and Scientific Method, we pride ourselves on doing philosophy in a way that is both continuous with the sciences and socially relevant. Meanwhile, our co-host for this event, the School of Public Policy, aims to put such ideas into practice, creating professionals with the ability to analyse, understand and resolve the challenges of contemporary governance. LSE's special relationship with science and society may be why the English Positivist Committee decided to institute an annual lecture in honour of August Comte in collaboration with the LSE. The first such lecture was given by Isaiah Berlin in 1953. The lecture was chaired by the conservative philosopher Michael Oakeshott. In his introduction, Oakeshott poked fun at Berlin, who'd become famous due to his lecture series being broadcast on the BBC. Oakeshott accused Berlin of showmanship, the worst crime an academic could ever be accused of. In Berlin's own words, this bitchy introduction upset him to such an extent that he gave the worst lecture of his life. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> let me introduce today's speaker. So Joseph Heath is an original and highly respected philosopher whose works today centre on the interactions between markets, individuals and governments. Joseph is famous for expounding what has come to be known as the market failures approach to business ethics, which broke new ground in the field and has come to be the foundation for many business ethics courses, including our own here at the LSE. Alongside these important advances on the cutting edge of philosophy, Joseph has written several best-selling popular books. These include a critique of countercultural consumerism in The Rebel Cell, and the brilliantly titled Filthy Lucre, Economics for People Who Hate Capitalism. <laughs> Today, Joseph will continue in Auguste Comte's tradition of applying science to society as he speaks about recent advances in the understanding of human sociality. Uh, so I have a presentation, but there, and there was a way to switch it so that the presentation started to happen. There we go, there we go, okay. I was going to say, I felt like there was a slight decline in enthusiasm in the room <laughs> when you said he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> like, that said it started out better than it ended, um, it, although it is true, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, so I, I want to say, first of all, that I, I took the, uh, the, the Auguste Comte theme seriously, and so I thought I would, I would run with that, uh, and then it gave me an opportunity to talk about one of my first loves, which is the sort of the state of the social sciences and the philosophy of social science. And so, um, so obviously Auguste Comte is, is best known as the founder of positivism, um, but he's also perhaps uh, second best known as the inventor or the coiner of the term sociology. Uh, and 
What uh, Comte had in mind uh, for the development of a sociology was that the creation, he envisioned the creation of a kind of universal science of social relations. And he thought that this was necessary, uh, not only for the sort of ordinary scientific purposes of better understanding human society, but also contrary somewhat to the current connotations of the term positivism, uh, he wanted to have a sociology in order to better improve society. So that in order for the society to better serve its members, he thought quite reasonably, we needed to have a better understanding of how social relations actually function and operate. Um, and so sociology was really, really central to his scheme of social improvement. Um, so it remains the case actually, well, so if you say, well, how's that been going, right? Like, how far have we come in the development of this kind of universal science of society? The answer clearly has to be um, that it, we certainly have not lived up to Kohn's initial enthusiasm for the project. Uh, in that the social sciences are, are, are no longer unified, or sorry, no longer, are not currently unified. Uh, they could probably best be described as fragmentary. Um, but there has nevertheless been, what I want to suggest in tonight's lecture and what I want to talk about, is there has actually been improvement, though. There has been movement in that direction. Um, so while we still don't have a, a sociology in the way in which Colt used that term, uh, we've come a little bit closer to having one. Um, and so I want to reflect just a little bit about how, I mean, just changes that I've seen and developments that I've seen over the course of my now, uh, including being a student, 40-year career uh, in the academy. Uh, so when I was a student, when I first entered undergraduate uh, study in the 1980s, rather than having a unified social science, what we had was something more like a set of warring camps. Uh, in other words, uh, the social sciences were, were strictly fragmented into different disciplines. Um, well, we're still in different disciplines, but what was central feature of them, though, was that when you went to talk to people in these different disciplines, they gave you very, very contrary stories about how society operates, how individuals decide, how interaction occurs, and so forth. Not only did they have different views on the matter, but they would tell you that the people down the hall have the wrong view on the matter. Right? And so that as an, you know, when you chose which discipline you wanted to go into as an undergraduate, you sort of were choosing which camp you wanted to belong to, and that required rejecting uh, the, the postulates and approaches of people in those other camps. Um, and so you know, most obviously, uh, people in economics put an enormous amount of emphasis on individual rational action and utility maximization. Uh, in, I'm calling it anthropology. I could have put sociology there as well, but that would have been confusing given the previous slide. Um, but that rather you had a, a set of uh, social science disciplines that put an enormous amount of emphasis on culture, um, and in particular on, on rule following or on social norms as the, the central feature of, of the way which social relations are structured. And, and then in the 80s, you had the development of a kind of very aggressive sort of sociobiology um, that generated its own tensions because apart from rejecting the economist's rationality postulate, um, they also rejected uh, the, the s culture and the, the idea that culture actually played a significant role or that it had explanatory power when it came to understanding social relations. So when I started out as an undergraduate, there was a lot of antagonism um, between these different uh, uh, disciplinary approaches. Um, and yes, as a student, you would, you would routinely get told that those other people down the hall just have it completely wrong. Um, now, I'd like to think that that situation has improved somewhat. Um, that is that there is, that, well, I mean, I can report clearly that there is significantly less antagonism between these different approaches. And there's a very complicated story that I'm not going to get into about how that occurred. Although I'll, I'll simply mention that, um, that you know, so, uh, game theory was an important aspect of that. In other words, the focus on, on, on action and on the nature of rational action and uh, a, an improvement in the clarity of our specification of how we understand rational action um, did a, an enormous amount to break down some of these disciplinary um, walls, uh, in part because the, the increased clarity allowed social scientists to develop very specific and testable hypotheses. Um, so that you could, act, if, if someone comes along and say, this is how people make decisions, right? You could generate a very clear model. You could check and see whether people actually do make decisions that way. And then if they don't, you could talk about modifying the model. So for example, a lot of the hostility to the concept of rule following in economics dissolved because of the development of experimental economics, which allowed people to demonstrate quite clearly that in fact people follow rules, right? Um, and then if, you know, whatever. So you could refine the model in order to make it absolutely clear that people do in fact significantly, you know, their behavior is significantly affected by social norms, for example. So there's been progress in various ways. Um, and uh, so the way things look now, I'd like to suggest, 
is less like the kind of warring disciplines and more like a, a puzzle that's sort of halfway to being completed. And so when you, when you, when you put a, a puzzle out uh, on the table and you start putting it together, um, you know, initially it looks like complete chaos, but you start to notice some patterns and so you start putting pieces together, uh, the easiest parts of the puzzle. And so you often like, I'm sure you've all seen this, where you have like kind of little islands starting to develop of puzzle pieces where you can see how they fit together, right? And you've got the frame going and you still don't know exactly where the piece is going to wind up in the frame, right? That is, you know, it's not locked into position yet, right? But you can see that it's starting to like coalesce, right? And then the big excitement is when you, two of these big chunks, get, you can put them together, right? And then you think, now I'm solving this puzzle. Right? So I, I, it's actually an appropriate visual metaphor for thinking about the current uh, situation in the social sciences. And so what I want to talk about um, are two of these sort of clusters or these clumps that have developed where we're actually making some progress in thinking about, about um, you know, sort of the basic fundamental features of human social interaction. So I want to illustrate it by talking about a particular topic that's occupied an enormous amount of attention in the social sciences generally. And the, the topic is one of what we gets referred to as a kind of term of art as ultra-sociality. Uh, and namely, it's an attempt to explain why human social interaction is characterized by an extraordinarily high level of cooperativeness. Right? So apparently, uh, we're, we are now, um, in the last 50 years, have become the most cooperative species on the planet. Namely, that the level of sociality, so the division of labor and the interdependence of human social relations, we, we, we've, we've just, in the past few decades, we've overtaken the ants uh, as the most uh, social species on the planet. Um, so now if aliens land, they actually do have good reason to talk to us and not the ants as the most sort of complex civilization on the planet. Um, now, there's a whole sort of set of puzzles around that, um, and there are various as aspects of it that are, that, um, there are sociality is manifested in different ways. Um, uh, you know, so, for example, uh, one of the things that human beings do uh, is that we allow genetically unrelated individuals to care for our dependent children. Right? So anybody who hired a babysitter to come here this evening right, will be familiar with the phenomenon in that we allow strangers to look after our, our helpless and dependent children. Uh, and we do so routinely. We don't take this to be an sort of extraordinary thing to do. But if you look at the animal kingdom generally, it's actually a very, very uncommon pattern of behavior. It's called eusociality, and we do it, and surprise, surprise, the ants do it. Um, but there are very few other animal species that do that. Um, so there's an example of human sociality and cooperativeness. So it's not the one I'm going to focus on tonight. The one I'm going to focus on is the division of labor. And so the division of labor, as my picture is supposed to illustrate, is the most, at the moment, kind of spectacular system of cooperation, um, which I won't try to belabor too much, but just to say that in order for me to be here this evening talking about philosophy, you know, literally millions of people have to have in some way contributed to make this possible. So obviously I don't live in the UK. I, I arrived in Heathrow yesterday um, because I have an interest in also soci sociality. I kind of love peering at airports. Um, and it's, it's sort of not even that it, they necessarily do it well, but merely that, it, that they do it. It's sort of extraordinary, right? So an airport is an extraordinarily complicated organization. And the number of individuals who have to contribute, we get all upset if your plane is like an hour late or whatever, right? But the whole thing is a miracle, right? Um, and so I, that's how I enjoy myself at airports, is I look at the miracle of cooperativeness as I stare out the window. Um, uh, all right, so I'm going to focus on, on, on the division of labor. And I want to say that this is an area in which then the development of game theory also really, really helped to sharpen up people's understanding of what the major explanatory challenges are. Uh, because when we talk about cooperation, uh, there's a tendency to underestimate the difficulty of the explanatory challenge that it poses because the benefits of cooperation are so large, it just seems like it must be easy to explain, right? Well, how? Well, you point to the benefits, right? You say, oh, you know, why are they doing that? And you say, well, because they're all better off as a result of doing it. That's why they do it. So there was uh, a sort of complacency uh, around, cooper uh, around cooperativeness um, which is induced by partly the ease with which we human beings cooperate with one another, but also this kind of the allure of, of, of just pointing to the benefits. Um, and so uh, the game theory helped to bring about a, a, a realization, which is that cooperation is actually uh, not easy to accomplish, uh, and that's in fact why it's so rare in nature. That's why when I talk about human cooperatives, I talk about ants and bees and social insects and so forth, but I don't talk about cats. 
or like wolves and so forth, right? Because there are very few species on the planet that exhibit high levels of cooperativeness. Uh, and the reason for that, it sort of very, became very economically stated in a game theoretic idiom, is to say the reason is because of the free rider problem. Namely, that while cooperation produces enormous benefits, you know what makes, you know, produces even more benefits is receiving all of the benefits of cooperation, but then not reciprocating, right? Not doing your part in the cooperative scheme. So that's the free rider. And then the free rider problem is not that people get away with free riding, it's that because of the presence of free riders, no one cooperates. Right? So you can think of this, I'll just sort of put this up as a sort of short little axiom, that so cooperation is really hard to understand because if the benefits of cooperation were sufficient to explain the, the evolution of cooperation, then you could look out your window and all you would see was a sea of cooperation, right? It would be absolutely ubiquitous in nature. But in fact, cooperation is extraordinarily rare in nature amongst individuals. Within your own body, you have a very high level of cooperativeness, right? But between individual organisms, you have very, very low levels of cooperativeness. So there was a kind of explanatory inversion where something that seemed obvious suddenly came to seem very, very problematic. And then that generated a lot of really, really great work. Um, and uh, there was also a kind of uh, self-satisfaction around cooperativeness where, again, because of this tendency to underestimate the free rider problem, there was an assumption that the reason we are, are uh, super cooperative is just because we're smart. Um, and intellectuals, I think, have a tendency to over sort of over uh, uh, generalize, thinking that, that being smart explains a lot more than it actually does. So it was thought that we, you know, human beings, we cooperate. Why? Well, because we're the smartest species on the planet. And being smart, we can see the benefits. So we just kind of do what's necessary to produce those benefits. Again, there was a realization that, that smartness doesn't necessarily enhance cooperativeness. Being smart can also make you a better free rider, right? So if anything, it tends to just exacerbate that free rider problem. Uh, and so not only is human smartness not an explanatorily useful posit, um, we also have these dramatic instances of organisms that are not so smart uh, cooperating. And so here's a picture of our friend the ants uh, engaging in two practices that are extraordinarily uncommon in, in nature. Uh, and so on the left, yes, on the left, we have, uh, we have ants engaging in animal husbandry. In, other, they're, in this case, they're farming aphids, which they, they milk. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have ants engaging in agriculture. So these are leafcutter ants who are composting the fungal farms, which they subsequently eat. Um, now, both animal husbandry uh, and um, agriculture uh, produce enormous benefits. And one might think that they're also kind of obvious innovations, right? So if you think of how much time animals spend looking for food, right? So you think of like cats chasing mice. You might at some point, wonder, we take it for granted, but you might wonder, you know, when they catch the mouse and they devour it, right? You know, why, why be in such a hurry? Why not catch two mice, breed them, and eat their children, right? Like it's a, like a lot less work, right? So like... The, like you don't have to be you don't have to be super smart in order to figure that out, as witnessed by the ants, who we take to be individually not that smart, and yet they engage in animal husbandry. But why do no other ma like do no mammals engage in animal husbandry? Well, so the answer is that they're it's, they're uncooperative, right? Instead of eating it now, you have to breed them and then wait, right? So you have to have some kind of assurance that you're going to be able to get the benefits, right? And so you have to have a solution to the free rider problem. Ants have a solution to the free rider problem, which is why they engage in animal husbandry and agriculture. All other mammals, with the exception of us, right, do not have a solution to that free rider problem, so they do not engage in agriculture. Right? You don't have to be smart, as the ants have proven. Um, OK, well, the thing about humans, though, is that, well, we haven't been doing agriculture. I mean, ants, it took them 80 million years to evolve agriculture. Uh, and then only the North American strain do it, sorry. Um, and uh, so there's a, this whole evolutionary story about how they got to be that way. Whereas with humans, and there's also, uh, it's actually everything, uh, everything that I report, there's people who disagree with it. But with ants, there's a relatively straightforward biological explanation as well for their heightened level of cooperativeness. Um, so with humans, we have a peculiar situation because we, are, we don't have the kind of obvious biological anomalies that would explain why we're so cooperative. But also, certain practices like agriculture are of relatively recent vintage. That is, that humans have not practiced agriculture since the beginning of our species, but rather, you know, there's a big debate about this as well, but, you know, roughly speaking, only in the last 10,000 years. Right? So there's a whole question then as to exactly how cooperativeness is sustained in human societies. 
Um, and so the focus in the case of humans is on what I'm gonna, over the course of the talk, refer to as being essentially the social order. So if you look at human cooperativeness, is the, the level of cooperativeness that humans exhibit is strongly affected by the institutional and social context in which they find themselves. Right? So, we find, we, you know, so we live in societies that are structured by rules. Right? That's the social order. And that induces a certain level of cooperativeness. And that level of cooperativeness has seen a trajectory of increased complexity over time. Um, and so I'm going to focus on, on, on social scientific theorizing about the nature of human social orders. And um, just to keep everyone awake, I'm going to start with a, a, a ridiculous overstatement. Um, <laughs> That is not from me. Um, but so this, this occurs in, in a book that's been enormously influential called Violence and Social Orders by Douglas North, John Wallace, and Barry Weingast. And so they kind of proclaim that all of human history, there have been but three social orders. And um, so what they say, though, I mean, you know, the, underlying the, un, the overstatement, there's an underlying truth, which is that when you look at, at, at human societies throughout time, you see an enormous amount of variation with respect to culture. Um, you see a lot less variation with respect to social structure. Like the, in other words, the basic way in which the society is organized. There aren't that many tricks that work well when it comes to organizing a society. And that's part of the tantalizing aspect of studying early civilizations, is that you get a lot of civilizations that had no contact with each other, but that, that exhibit sort of extraordinary sort of parallels in aspects of their social structure. Even though their religions are totally different and stuff like that, the social structure is more constrained. So there's been a lot of focus on, on understanding social structure, in part because it seems to be the area where, where the constraints are more interesting. So they, they have these three social orders, and it is actually a useful generalization. Um, so they break out all of human history into, um, first of all, what they call the foraging order, which is the one that began uh, with the evolution of anatomically modern humans roughly 200,000 years ago, um, and that extended until what Jared Diamond calls yesterday. Right. And so yesterday is the so-called Neolithic Revolution that occurred around 10,000 years ago, which gave rise to a lot of changes, but probably the most important being the, the development of political authority or the state. And so the second one is called the, the natural state, uh, is the term they use for it. Uh, and that's what uh, the, the, you know, and if it hadn't been for Great Britain, we'd probably still be there, right? That is the, with the, uh, with the, the, and then the third one is what they call the open access order, which I'm not going to talk about, which is essentially the Industrial Revolution and the, and the, the sequel. Um, so well, what I want to discuss um, are these, these two um, orders and the, the really foundational and interesting work that's been done in the social sciences at understanding first the foraging order and then second that Neolithic revolution and the transition to the natural state. Um, so first of all, the foraging order. Um, so here the goal is to try to explain the basic um, sort of onboard cooperative capacities that all human beings exhibit at birth or something like that, or that develop over the course of early childhood. In other words, so these are the kind of universal and basic competencies that all human beings possess. And, um, and that's an attempt to understand why human beings, and there's very, very good reason to think that human beings have been cooperative, um, not just in the last 10,000 years, right, but since the development of anatomically modern humans. So for example, like if you look at hunter-gatherer societies, there's al almost a universal practice of, for example, meat sharing, right? So the idea that when there's food becomes available that, that, should be, that there should be rules for its distribution appears to be universal and also appears to be um, a, a, an important factor in the ecological success of, of early humans, right? And so the, 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 the implication is that humans have always been more highly cooperative than other primates. And there's a, there's a puzzle, however, about, about the evolution of that, right? So that the, obviously the story prior to the development of it needs to be a, a, a story that relies upon a sort of Darwinian natural selection. Uh, and then the question, though, is to understand how you got the evolution of the package of competencies that then allowed human beings to develop a more cooperative social order. And there, there's two well-known stylized positions, um, both of which are sort of generate, if anything, just a puzzle. Um, and that's, so that's the old kind of nature-nurture debate, is to ask whether or not human cooperativeness um, is culture, is something that's pr the product of socialization, or whether or not it's biological. And um, so any, I think any parent, I think, has to be at least disposed towards the view that it's highly cultural, <laughs> because you spend so much of your time as a parent 
uh, trying to get your kids to stop engaging in various forms of antisocial behavior. Right? Um, and so, for example, um, children hit other people. Um, and that's a, a universal feature of human infants, right? Which is they strike other people. And in order to get things, to express frustration, et cetera, et cetera, they're hitting people. And so as a parent, you spend an enormous amount of time saying, stop hitting, stop hitting, stop hitting, stop hitting, right? So what are you doing? You're socializing your child to stop hitting, right? And so they're not born angels. They need to learn uh, to not hit people. Similarly with sharing, sharing also doesn't seem super innate. <laughs> um, that is, children are highly possessive. You want to take away the toy, right? They, they probably hit you. Right? So then you have to spend an enormous amount of time as a parent. I think probably second most common thing parents say is share, 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 right? as a way of reducing conflict. So parents often feel as if you know, children are born somewhat beastly and become somewhat more tractable through processes of socialization. Right? So there's a lot of intuitions that push in the direction then of this cultural thing that you know, we're not naturally born angels, uh, but we have to learn that. On the other hand, though, human beings have a set of, of biological adaptations um, that, that, are, that appear to be highly pro-social in their orientation. Uh, and so a purely cultural story doesn't seem to be entirely correct. Uh, there has to be sort of fertile ground for those seeds to be planted in. Uh, and there has to be some kind of an evolutionary story that explains some of these competencies. And so probably the most striking research on this is done on very young infants. I mean, they do exhibit spontaneous empathy, which is not that difficult to explain. But there's... Um, Particular experiments done by, for example, Michael Tomasello on spontaneous helping behavior in toddlers um, that is really quite striking because it's, it's cognitively complex, spontaneous helping. So that a child you know, sees someone trying to accomplish an objective at an obstacle and they spontaneously intervene to try to help that person overcome the obstacle. Right? So very pro-social kind of behavior. No one's taught them to do that. We're very, very young children and it's super complicated. So that looks like there's got to be also a biological story about, it, about how we develop this kind of pro-sociality. So there's warring camps on this. Um, but there has been um, the development of, I think, like real progress in trying to solve this particular puzzle. Uh, and so that involves the development of what's known as gene culture coevolutionary theory. Um, and as the title suggests, it's an attempt to tease out the, the contribution made by both the biological and the genetic and then the cultural and the way in which the two have interacted over the course of human history. Um, and so this is primarily due to the work of Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson uh, who, and their students who have gone on to popularize but also further develop the theory. And so I want to just sort of briefly describe the way the, the theory goes because it is one of these first kind of clusters that's emerged. Um, so the first step in the process is to recognize that no matter how you know, there is a tendency to, to want to, I mean, I'm in a humanities department, right, um, to want to kind of point it to culture as a sort of get out of jail free card. Um, that once you call it cultural, then, you know, anything can happen, right? We're free from all the constraints of biology and nature and so forth, right? Um, and, you know, that can't be entirely true, but one way to see how that can't be true is to trace it back then and to observe that the kind of plasticity that underlies human culture itself has to be a biological adaptation, right? Most other species don't have culture, right? So something has to have happened that's going to be a straightforward Darwinian story, that it's going to explain how it is that we acquired whatever cognitive competencies it is that then allows us to become cultural beings. And then maybe later on you can do whatever you want, right? But certainly that preliminary story has to be the straightforward naturalistic one. And so, and what are the, what are the adaptations or competencies that are going to underlie culture? Uh, it, clearly it's going to have to do with our learning style. And so this investigation into, hu into human social learning and the discovery, unsurprisingly, um, that humans have a, an incredible facility when it comes to learning from other, co from conspecifics, right? So we learn from the environment, but we also learn from each other. And we learn from each other much more than most other species do. Um, and we have a particular style of social learning um, which is significant, namely that we are not only highly imitative, particularly human infants who are, are sometimes described as like imitation machines, right? highly imitative, but the way in which we imitate is also extremely mechanical, they, namely that we reproduce exactly mirroring the activity of the person, the model that we're imitating, often without insight into what that person is doing. And so that particular social learning style is taken to be responsible for the development of culture where culture arises once you start to get the transmission of particular traits across multiple generations. And 
The thing about the development of transmission over multiple generations is it creates the possibility of a second evolutionary system where you can get cumulative cultural transmission so that one person can invent something, people copy it, and then those people can make slight modifications to it, and then that gets passed on, right? So descent with modification begins to occur in culture. Right? And because people are just mechanically imitating, there's a sort of high fidelity of copying that then allows culture to develop increased complexity. So you can get cultural artifacts developing that are far more complicated than anything that a single person could possibly have invented. All right, so it's our style of social learning is what gives rise to culture. Um, that itself would not be so interesting. That, you know, that, that we have this cultural inheritance system would not be super interesting were it not for then this uh, third phenomenon, which is referred to as biased transmission. Right? So this is bias not in a pejorative sense, but in the statistical sense. And so if you take biological transmission to be unbiased, what it means is that sort of representation in the population is what determines the probability of representation in the subsequent generation. Now, culture could also be a system of unbiased transmission. So for example, if the only person that you ever learned anything from were your parents, then culture would be, sub would be subject to exactly the same evolutionary dynamics as genetic transmission. And so with unbiased, trans so that would be unbiased transmission, imitate your parents, that's everything you learn. If that were the case, culture would be faster than biology, but it would not be different from biology. In other words, nothing could evolve within the cultural space of behavior that could not also have evolved biologically because, because culture would be subject to exactly the same constraints as biological evolution. So you're not going to get an explanation of cooperativeness out of that, because if cooperation can't evolve biologically, then it couldn't evolve culturally either in a system of unbiased cultural transmission. But in fact, culture is subject to various biases. And what that means is that there's behavior you can engage in that makes you more likely to get copied by others, but that has nothing to do with your reproductive fecundity, say. Right? So for an example of that would be the presence of role modeling within cultural transmission. So you learn things, parents, I mean, this, again, I'm sounding a lot like a parent, but it's frustrating, actually, all this unbiased transmission. You want your kids to just learn from you. Um, but at about the age of seven, they start looking at their peers, and they start imitating role models and stuff like that, right? You lose control of it, right? OK. Um, uh, and then uh, <laughs> finally, the, so that, the reason bias transmission is interesting, though, is that it, allow, it diverts culture so that now you can start to get traits that are sustained culturally that could never have evolved biologically, right? So if you think initially of culture biology working in lockstep, bias transmission culture veers off and you start to get stuff that could never have occurred in a, so it's not just faster, right? It's, it's allowing for the evolution of different stuff, right? That could not have evolved biologically. And then, this is like the cherry on the soda, right? Culture also then, start, especially as it becomes more complex, starts to affect the environment of evolutionary adaptation. And as a result, it begins to affect biological selection as well, right? So what happens is you get an effect of social selection as opposed to natural selection. So biological evolution normally is subject to processes of natural selection. When culture diverges and creates these novel environments, you also get forces of selection that then derail biology, right? So that biological evolution starts to produce structures that could never have evolved within a purely biological system, but are only evolving because culture has radically modified the social environment. Right, so that's the generic structure of gene culture coevolutionary theory. It explains all kinds of things about our physiology, for example. Uh, yeah, I'll get to it. <laughs> um, now here's how it specifically applies to the, to the task of cooperation. Um, oh no, oh yeah. My screen stopped right. Okay. Um, okay, so bias transmission. There's multiple forms of bias in transmission. One of them is that uh, transmission in culture has a conformist bias, right? This is what irritates parents of teenagers, right? Is that teenagers are conformist. And what that means is that when we learn from peers, uh, we often select the kind of median behavior within the peer group, right? So we conform to median and majority behavior. So that's conformism. Conformism is thought to have reduced the, uh, the seriousness of the free rider problem, right? Because free riding typically involves departure from a cooperative scheme. And if people become more conformist, that's likely to have had a variety of effects. One of them is to have somewhat attenuated free rider problems. So there's specific and very technical views on exactly how that happened. 
But the thought then is that culture, because of conformist transmission, generated a higher level of cooperativeness. So while we still biologically were not super cooperative, we started living in societies where the, the culturally patterned system of behavior started demanding a higher level of cooperativeness. And then that generated the phenomenon of self-domestication. Right? So domestication um, is associated with a set of often physiological changes um, that are largely the product of selection for reduced aggressiveness. So Richard Wrangham is probably the most important person in having sort of popularized this thesis. And so if you look at dogs, for example, or any other sort of domestic species, um, the thing about dogs is that they clearly have been selected for reduced aggressiveness. So you take wolves and you just keep the friendly as puppies, right? Uh, and once they bite someone, you throw them out or kill them, right? And you select for the, the, the ones that are the least aggressive. Um, selection for reduced aggressiveness generates a syndrome of, of changes, a whole package of changes associated with domestication. Uh, and so one of the sort of aha moments uh, comes from the observation that human beings exhibit some of those same physiological features. In other words, we all, you look at dogs, you can infer that they're a domesticated species just from looking at their physiology. If you look at a human being, we also look like a domesticated species. Um, but then the question is, who domesticated us? The answer is, well, we domesticated ourselves. Right? But how? It's conformity and heightened cooperativeness acting as a force of social selection, leading to biological changes for, for reduced aggressiveness and higher levels of prosociality. So that's why we have biological adaptations that make us, that, that could never have just evolved in a purely, you know what I mean, like a purely Darwinian system. Right? It's only with this derailing of culture and then culture acting as a force of social selection that you wound up then with these biological changes that we see for, and also the kind of competencies that you see with very young, young children. All right, uh, but at the same time, the domestication is obviously incomplete. Uh, and that explains a feature that we all experience, I think, in our lives, right? Which is that society puts demands on us that are slightly more moral um, <laughs> than those in which we're sort of naturally disposed to engage in, right? So in the privacy of our own minds, we have all kinds of antisocial and aggressive impulses, right? And we don't fully act upon them. Uh, and so th that is, social norms are still a source of constraint upon us because culture still pushes in the direction of higher level of cooperativeness, right, than our kind of trailing biology. Uh, so what you get with this self-domestication story <clears throat> is not a full-on account of ultrasociality. What you get is a, a, an account of the kind of basic cooperative dispositions that human infants have. Um, and what's important, though, about that is that it, I mean, it explains an important piece of the puzzle in the development of the foraging order, but it doesn't get us to the thing that we're trying to explain, which is the, the, which is the you know, complex civilization. All right. So that takes us then to the, the next of the two orders that I want to talk about. <clears throat> and that's the development of, of the so-called natural state or the Neolithic Revolution. So the Neolithic Revolution um, it, has been a subject of incredibly intense scholarship uh, in the last 20 years. And, and, you know, and I'm just a spectator of this, but an enormous amount of incredibly uh, productive and interesting work has been done uh, on this period of change. Um, and, and again, there was, there was a certain kind of complacency about it that has been eliminated, and people have come to see how problematic it is to explain it. So when people, I mean, even using the term Neolithic Revolution is, is controversial. People debate whether or not it happened and when it happened and so on. But there's clearly a set of changes that seem to have gone together that involve the development of much, much higher population densities, the emergence of cities, the development of sedentary living, agriculture, intensification of war, the development of religion, um, and anything I missed on that? Uh, yeah, I think I got the, the basics of it, right? Uh, so war, religion, cities, agriculture, right, is a package of changes that occurred around 10,000 years ago. Um, central to it is also the development of, of social classes. And by social classes, are understood the development of a kind of functional specialization in the kind of work that people do. So the foraging order has a gender-based specialization of labor, but typically nothing beyond that, right? so that everyone does all jobs. Uh, and one of the things that you see with the Neolithic Revolution is the development of what Thomas Piketty calls ternary societies. Um, that is, there's a lot of variation around the world, but one of the things that you see like really, really consistently emerging um, is the development of these kind of three classes familiar from European history. So that is the peasant, the knight, and the priest. Right? That is, you get a military class, a bunch of soldiers, you get a religious class, a priestly class, and then you get the people who do all the work. 
Um, and uh, so this is the, the, the tri-functional schema. And so a lot of work has been focused on trying to understand that, uh, why it's so persistent um, and all pervasive. Um, so earlier views on the emergence of um, the Neolithic, Neolithic Revolution, again, tended to be overly sanguine about the possibility of cooperation. That is, they thought that um, kind of the good things that came from civilization explained the emergence of civilization. Right? So how did agriculture come about? Uh, people would say, oh, well, you know, as population density increased, they needed more food. So they started doing agriculture or something like that. Or like, how did the state come about? And it's like, oh, well, you know, once they needed irrigation projects, I mean, this was a very popular theory in the 50s and 60s, the so-called hydraulic theory of state formation, was that they needed irrigation. And the only way to do that is to have much, much more organized labor uh, parties. And therefore, uh, that gave rise to the state or whatever. So all those explanations were also kind of like the benefits of cooperation, explaining the emergence of cooperation. Uh, and increased attention to the free rider problem suggested um, that, that, that it doesn't work that easily, right? That is, that there's a real problem explaining how these formations emerged. The need for them doesn't explain their emergence. Otherwise, they could have emerged, you know, 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, right? But why did they emerge at this particular point in time? Um, and then the second thing is a lot of scholarship is focused on this. It's by saying, you know, this benefits of civilization stuff is like ridiculous. It's only started to really pay off in the last couple hundred years that um, for the most part uh, with the, the Neolithic Revolution, the overwhelming majority of the population suffered a clear decline in their quality of life. Uh, and you can see that with the development of reduced stature, right? So people uh, uh, experienced nutritional deficiencies, uh, much, much greater exposure to epidemic diseases, um, and significant intensification of patriarchy, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So, like, you know, so there's a lot of people who sort of argued that it was actually bad for people, right? And so if you look back at human history, uh, so James Scott has sort of provocatively said, you know, for 190,000 years, people succeeded in avoiding the development of the state, right? So the question is why they suddenly lost the struggle 10,000 years ago. I, I mean, this is a little bit of an overstatement, but it, it, it sort of accentuates the point, right? Which is that people didn't really do, they didn't make out like bandits from the early development of civilization. Um, so there's a whole bunch of mysteries around this. Um, and so one of the ones that has attracted a lot of attention, the, the mysteriousness, is, is hierarchy. And, what the, and this is politically controversial, so it's, it's attracted a lot of somewhat politicized contributions as well. But you see... Uh, hierarchy emerging at the same time that you see an increase in the scale of human societies. And so then there's a whole puzzle around um, why you saw the emergence of hierarchy, why it's so uniform, and the various things that went with hierarchy. So obviously patriarchy became much, much more severe. You also got intensification of slavery and so forth, right? So you know, when I talk about class, it, it, it immediately evokes the idea of hierarchy. Right? So what was the connection uh, between this increase of scale, the development of hierarchy is a bit of a mystery. Uh, second mystery is like priests. Like, why are there always priests, right? Like, like you know, like the soldier thing I get, right? That, that is, um, I mean, although they caused a lot of trouble, you can nevertheless, you can see what they're doing, right? Um, whereas priests are, are very strange, and especially from a kind of Marxist background, where priests are treated as kind of superstructural, right? And not like moving gears, right? <clears throat> but then if you actually study early human civilizations, you could almost formulate it as a law, you know, no cities without priests. Um, that is, there's always a temple. I mean, the archaeological record sometimes is biasing, right? But there's always temples um, and incredible social resources dedicated towards them. So, like, why priests? Like, what were they f functionally contributing uh, is a bit of a mystery that's, again, attracted a huge literature. Um, and then there's another thing that's attracted a massive literature, which is that the phenomenon of collapse, right? So unlike foraging societies, civilizations have a tendency to collapse. Uh, and so there are many tantalizing uh, instances of this. But this is, of course, always something which has been a profound current in European culture, simply because Europeans for so many centuries lived in the shadow of Rome, right? Uh, of a civilization whose, whose accomplishments were available, like they, they knew about them, but weren't able to reproduce them. Um, and so collapse has always been a source of scholarly fascination as well, right? Like why, do civil, like why are these, uh, why, why do you get these sudden reversals? Again, given the benefits that obviously come from these more complex cooperative systems. Um, so one way of thinking about this problem, which um, again, like a little piece of the puzzle that's forming, um, is that it's actually based on an old idea. So this is why I say we're putting pieces together. There's actually an old idea in sociology about this um, that, uh, that is um, 
that you know, can sort of be connected in uh, to the story about cooperation that you see from the gene culture coevolutionary theory. So the answer to the, the, the one, one attractive answer to this question is to say that <clears throat> one way which we can, exp so the, the, our basic cooperative competencies give you the foraging order. One of the things about the foraging order is that it, it imposes an upward bound on the complexity of societies and the number of individuals who can be integrated into a cooperative system, right? So like uh, in the thousands is about the largest society you can sustain with those basic competencies. After the Neolithic Revolution, you start to get the development of societies that actually control lives of millions, right? And so empires in particular that have millions of individuals who are incorporated. So you get a kind of significant increase in the scale of cooperation, right? How does that occur? One way of thinking about it is to say, and that you get this out of the gene culture evolutionary theory, that cooperation itself is a kind of a task that involves certain kinds of social preconditions. And when those social preconditions are satisfied, we can then cooperate to better improve our performance with respect to some task. Right? Um, one of the things you can do, however, is you can treat creating the social conditions of cooperation as itself a task amenable to enhancement through cooperation. In other words, you can apply our cooperative competencies to the amplification of our cooperative competencies. So I've sort of struggled to find a good metaphor for this. The best I can think of is a kind of, it's like an example of sort of financial leverage, where like you borrow money in order to borrow more money in order to then make an investment, right? And so one way of understanding the Neolithic revolution is to say that this is um, what we essentially did, right? That is, we, we applied a particular strategy of cooperation, namely the development of a division of labor, uh, to the task of maintaining and reproducing the social order. Right? And that dramatically in, in, enhanced the scalability and the power of that social order. Um, so the, the idea, right, so, right, so you can either cooperate to, to enhance the, 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 the discharge of some task by introducing a division of labor, or you could cooperate to enhance our capacity for cooperation through the introduction of division, division of labor, and then that enhanced cooperative capacity could be used to then perform a great number of other tasks. And so this is an old idea from sociology that's kind of mooted by, by Durkheim, um, but that was actually developed in the, pretty extensively in, in the 1960s by Talcott Parsons. Um, and he didn't like articulate it in exactly the way we would articulate it now, so I'm sort of reformulating the idea. But the thought is that those, right, what gives you that tri-functional society is the development of individuals who are specialized in discharging the tasks that are necessary to sustain social orders. So the first, the soldiers, are um, what you know, increasingly is referred to as the violent specialists. Right? So every human social order is sustained in part through punishment. Right? So because controlling free riders is essential to the reproduction of any cooperative scheme, right, there, there has to be punishment of free riders. But in the foraging order, that punishment is done in a completely decentralized way. So when, there's no one whose job it is to enforce the rules. When someone breaks the rules, the people around them have to take charge of, of correcting that behavior and punishing it. What happens with the development of violence specialists is you get individuals whose job is to inflict violence upon others, right? Sometimes that's unhelpful, right? But in other cases, it can be very helpful because they can also serve as enforcement specialists. Right? And so rather than relying upon a decentralized network of individuals to do your enforcement, which itself is subject to collective action problems, you wind up with a group of people whose job it is to inflict violence upon others, right? The enforcement specialists. So that's the introduction of a division of labor into the tasks required to sustain a social order, right? And that was, that was I mean, that's Parsons' idea. Um, and that's also Durkheim's idea about religion. And so, uh, so the, again, like I said, the soldiers are doing something that's kind of obvious, right? They're punishing people. Um, now, with re respect to priests, what exactly are they doing? Um, one way of understanding it is to say that, and again, there's a great and huge literature on religion and how it's different and its evolution and so forth. One of the characteristics of, of religion, though, is that it's, it's often better defined by its practices than by its ideational content. Right? And so some of the universal features of religion are practices of ritual and of worship, both of which appear to specifically target the learning biases that are essential to cultural transmission. Right? So if you look at ritual, one of the things about it is that it activates conformity. And worship activates the, the, the role modeling style of learning that we engage in. Um, and so a theory about the importance of religious specialists in all this is that culture initially is this inheritance system that nobody controls, right? Like it's just subject to various forces of psychological selection. 
but with the development of a class of individuals who specifically target the, the transmission biases of culture, you acquire the ability to steer cultural transmission, right? So not to control culture, but to steer it, right? So you can nudge it in one direction or another through these practices of ritual and worship. And therefore, you get, the trans you get the transformation of culture, which is this kind of abstract and diffuse thing, into ideology the way someone like, say, Michael Mann understands it, right? As, as a, a, um, a set of culturally transmitted traits that can actually be of service to a particular kind of social project. So those two combined are what give you the natural state. So when you wind up with hierarchical authority enforced by violent specialists and legitimated by, ideologically by religious specialists, Right? You then wind up with this highly, highly stable, but also effective social order expanding the scope of cooperation. Um, and it also, I should say, it, it answers some of these mysteries as well. Um, number one, it explains the emergence of hierarchy. Right? That is, the introduction of the violence specialist has the effect of disabling the central mechanism that preserves the egalitarianism of the foraging order. Right? So the way things work in the foraging order is that nobody, it's no one's specific job to punish anyone, anyone else for transgression of cooperative norms. Um, but the general social reaction to, to excessive aggressiveness or dominance behavior generates a social backlash. So this is what Rangam calls the process of, of offing the alphas that is thought to have been responsible for self-domestication. That is, individuals who are overly dominant in their behavior, right? because we still have underlying dominance instincts. Right? But the overly aggressive, largely male individuals who, who are like, excessively dominant attracted a punitive reaction. And therefore, you had a selection mechanism that sort of weeded out the extremes of aggressiveness from our gene pool. Right? That also had the effect of preserving egalitarianism in forager societies. Right? But once you, right, so it's that ad hoc coalition of individuals who suppress dominant behavior that creates egalitarianism. What happens with the development of violence specialists, though, right, is that an overly dominant or aggressive individual who also is able to rally violence specialists um, to his cause is able to resist any ad hoc coalition that forms. Right? So functional specialization in the production of social order disables the mechanism that preserved egalitarianism. And so people's kind of underlying then dominance instincts sort of run rampant. Right? So you get the emergence of hierarchy. Um, and then secondly, it, it attractively explains the phenomenon of collapse as well, right? which is that you know, cooperation because of free riding problems is always vulnerable to failure. Right? Like, you know, things can be going nicely, but then when people start taking advantage of it, everyone retaliates by saying, well, if they're not going to help, I'm not going to help, and then it all falls apart. So we're all familiar with failures of cooperation. When, when cooperation is, is dedicated just to the production of a particular task, Right? Those failures of cooperation are, are typically not spectacular. They're just you know, kind of a disappointment to those involved. But there's one system of cooperation that becomes essential to the broader system of cooperation of the society, namely the system of cooperation that amplifies the human capacity for cooperation winds up being the linchpin of the cooperative organization, like the social order as a whole. Right? If that cooperative system starts to fall apart, Right? Then you get a series of like cascading failures. Right? So you get dramatic effects. Right? Because what's falling apart is not a particular system of cooperation. It's the amplified capacity for expanded cooperation that's falling apart. Right? So that's why we call it collapse. I mean, human affairs go better and they go worse in all kinds of different ways. Right? Uh, but collapse is just particularly notable because it just seems so large scale. And also then what you get is a reversion to the foraging order. Right? You don't get a reversion to a Hobbesian state of nature where it's individualistic, right? You get a, 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 a return to a kind of groupishness, which is the level of cooperativeness we can sustain without that amplified capacity for cooperativeness, right? So you get this kind of phenomenon of like the collapsed civilizations. Um, and you know, so like I was reading an article that, that someone had bought, went and counted up in the literature all of the different causal explanations that have been given for the collapse of Rome. And they, they came up with something like 534 mm -hmm. <laughs> um, explanations that have been given, you know, starting with Gibbon uh, to the present, um, and it, it, which is fine and everything. You know, like it's a, a, a source of perennial interest and speculation. But one of the things that you know, a lot of them are, uh, uh, are kind of detailing specific things that happen, but one of the things that's really, really central to all of these stories is a collapse in military order and discipline. Right? And so that kind of speaks in favor of the sort of Durkheimian way of, of looking at it. Right? 
Um, but I, I'm not going to make a big pitch for that. I'm actually going to end with sort of an apology then for this entire lecture, um, <laughs> which is that um, I mean, people are already getting excited at the back of the room here. Um, so, so what am I doing, a philosopher, like blasting through all this stuff? Um, so, uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of uh, abusing, perhaps, or, or taking advantage of a sort of prerogative that we give ourselves in the Department of Philosophy. Um, so in philosophy, we often debate a variety of abstract topics. One, one of the topics we debate is what is philosophy. Uh, and there's a variety of rival definitions of philosophy. So, so my favorite uh, definition uh, or uh, specification of the aim of philosophy is from the great American philosopher Wilfred Sellers, where he says that the aim of philosophy is to understand things in the broadest sense of the term, or sorry, how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. Um, and so what I've been trying to do uh, here uh, is to talk about things at a very, very high level of generality and how things are starting to fit together. Um, and the reason I, can, I feel I can do this as a philosopher, I could not do this if I were a responsible social scientist, because if I were a responsible social scientist, I would have to then you know, mention not only the positions that I've been describing to you, but also all the people who disagree with those positions, all of the relevant citations to all the literature, et cetera, et cetera, right? Not presenting this as though these are like, you know, great advances, but rather, you know, in other words, I would have had to talk a lot more about the trees and a lot less about the forest. Um, one of the things, though, that attracted me to philosophy uh, in the first place was precisely that one can talk about things at a kind of higher level of generality. Um, and so I just want to, uh, you know, just end by, so by, first of all, say that's what I've been doing. Um, so these are vast, vast literatures that I'm describing. Uh, and so I'm talking about them at a very, very high level. Um, and then, um, and secondly, just to say that all of this is, is also extremely controversial. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll end. But um, to say those of you who do want to know like a little bit, um, uh, points of entry into this literature. So here are some of the primarily popular works, but also some scholarly work uh, of authors that I've been mentioning and I've been drawing upon over the course of the talk. Thank you. I got Alex staring at me. I feel like I have to say that in the philosophy department here, we are responsible social scientists. <laughs> um, so, so disregard the last slide. Um, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's open the floor to questions. So we've got about half an hour. Questions in the room or from our online audience are welcome. Please raise your hand. Okay, yeah, on the end of the row here. Uh, please wait until a microphone gets to you before you, uh, before you Thanks, that was speak. a fantastic picture, and um, I love the style of the quote and the idea that philosophy should be doing this kind of thing. But I wanted to ask you about one detailed part of the picture. So it's crucial to the way that you're telling this Dean Kotoko evolutionary story that uh, the cultural transmission route requires a biologically evolved conformity bias to get off the ground. When people were trying out the biologically involved, uh, involved direct dispositions to cooperate, then the problem is that biological evolution would introduce free riders or hops into the, into the and so the, the mix is not biologically stable. So with respect to conformity bias in the same way, why isn't it that you get free riders who no longer conform, so you know their priests are telling them to do something they, they lose conformity bias or in the foraging states they Yeah, so, so th that's a, a, a complicated area of theory. Um, and I would say it's probably not fully settled. So there's still a couple of magic asterisks, asterisks um, in this literature. But so, so the, the, the line that you get from, from Richardson and Boyd um, is that it's, it's, a, it's more complicated than I, than I alluded to, which is that um, what happens uh, is in the cultural space is that conformity bias doesn't kind of directly uh, squeeze out the free riders. What happens is conformity bias, as they put it, potentiates group selection. Right? So, so one of the things that's always been very tantalizing in the evolutionary explanation of human cooperativeness is that during the foraging order, um, human beings satisfied what was clearly one of the conditions for group selection uh, to be effective. Uh, so, so group selection, you know, uh, is sort of 
you know, in disrep disrepute, and then people tried to revive it, and so on and so forth. But it clearly is the case that during the foraging order, human beings lived in relatively small scale, intensely competitive and antagonistic groups. Right? And so that made a lot of people say, aha, right? human cooperativeness must have something to do with that group, with that, the conditions that existed, which seemed to have uh, you know, generated a group selection effect. Right? Now, in order for that to be the case, it has to be um, that the, the, the level of homogeneity uh, within groups is higher than the level of homogeneity between groups. Right? So you have to have greater heterogeneity between groups than within groups. Um, the problem with the biological story is that there appears to have historically you know, been too much gene flow between these groups. Namely, like if you look, and you know, people are generalizing for contemporary anthropology and so forth, right? But there, there appears to be a lot of exogamy within human competitive groups. So even though they're competing with one another, they're also intermarrying, right? And raping and having war, all this kind of stuff, right? So in other words, the, the, it appears that we failed the second condition uh, for group selection to have been effective in the biological domain because there wasn't enough genetic homogeneity within groups. And so a lot of people have been very uh, suspicious of a biological group selection story. So what the conformity picture does is it suggests, well, culture you know, is just like biological evolution. Aha, but because of conformity, you're going to have much, much higher level of, con of, of homogeneity within groups than between groups. So group selection, which wasn't a powerful force in the biological domain, might have suddenly become a much, much more powerful source. And so there's the kind of complicated theory. And then answering the question of detail would require then situating it within that more complicated theory. OK, great, thanks. I think there was another hand further. Uh, yeah, OK, OK, there is. Um, yeah, let's uh, come to you in the, in the, in the glasses here. Yeah. Oh, just wait until the microphone gets to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, really interesting lecture. Um, so when we were talking about how cooperation is uh, applied to cooperation and then applied to tasks, so the parallel seemed uh, uh, sort of similar to how they're sometimes talking about machine learning these days, how the sort of problem solving may be applied to problem solving by uh, artificial intelligence itself and then applied to tasks, and that may lead to explosion of um, all sorts of things. Uh, my question is, what do you think will happen to human cooperation if that happens in the sort of broadest possible sense of things? Is it going to explode as well? Is it going to deteriorate? Is it hard to tell how those two processes are going to interact? Yeah. What's your view? So that's a good question. So I hadn't really thought about kind of recursive application of that trick. I mean, so part of the reason people are worried about sort of, you know, the singularity with AI and stuff like that um, is that this sort of like, um, sort of self-amplification is one that then can, if you start auto-updating and you have a bunch of AIs learning from each other, interacting with each other, you could wind up with a kind of explosive increase in their level of sophistication um, from the fact that they can instantaneously update and learn from each other. Um, so, and I hadn't really thought about that, like in terms of the trick, whether or not you could reapply the trick. Um, and so my, my, my inclination is to say no, like it's a trick that only works once. Namely, that you're not just cooperating to enhance cooperation. It's like a specific cooperative strategy, which is to introduce a division of labor. Um, and the, I mean, there's different ways we can cooperate. A division of labor is a particular way of cooperating. So you introduce a division of labor to the task of cooperating, and then you get better at cooperating. But I, I am inclined to think that that's like a kind of one-time trick. Um, you know, what would it mean to the, like, introduce a division of labor to the subsequent classes? I mean, yeah, I guess so. I should think about that. Um, but, you know, to look at where we are today, I mean, so I'm explaining kind of like, you know, Rome. <laughs> um, to get where we are today, there's this whole thing about the open access order, which is kind of a way of soft peddling the market. Um, and the development of markets and bureaucracy is like the next stage of the story. Um, and, and so my inclination would be to switch to that next stage of the story, uh, rather than thinking about this idea of sort of, you know, looping back on itself to amplify. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's The guy in the back there has really wanted to go. Oh, that's okay. Okay, <laughs> okay let's, uh, let's go to the guy in the back then. Uh, and then we've got quite a few along the front. He had his hand up about like half an hour in, so I thought <laughs> we should give him the chance. All right, very keen. Thanks, amazing. Um, could you please summarize the gene culture co-evolutionary theory in a few sentences for... I want to remember that summary. 
That's a long question. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Um, can, like, can you guys show that? That's, that's the shortest I've, I've, I've ever gone. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, sorry, all I can do is say it again more slowly. You, you, could, uh, you could listen to the recording on double speed. Or, may, or maybe half speed. Uh, all, all I can say is, like, well, I read it a bunch of times. So, like, it took me a long time to get it. There's a couple points that I didn't get at first. All right? So what I didn't get was, first of all, I mean, because there's so many reversals of the burden of proof, right? Like, because, again, I, I maybe because I'm from the humanities, right? Culture is such a magical word at getting you out of trouble um, with respect to biological constraints and so on. So I just didn't get the fact that you can easily imagine the evolution of a cultural system that doesn't allow for the evolution of biologically maladaptive behavior, right? Like, so we think of culture as being allowing us to do whatever, right? But why, why would evolution produce a system of learning that allows you to do a bunch of like, dumb stuff that gets you killed, right? Uh, or super nice things that help other people reproduce. Right? Like, th that's a big mystery. So the idea that a bi biological system could easily have e evolved a, cult a capacity for cultural transmission that was also locked into the same biological track so that you couldn't get maladaptive behaviors, that's a kind of default expectation. So you need to have a specific explanation for why culture allows the development of these traits to get passed on that are causing us to have fewer children and all this kind of stuff, right? So that was that bit about bias transmission. It took me a long time. Um, uh, to figure out why that was so important. And then the, the stuff about self-domestication is less Boyd and Richardson and more like you know, Henrik and, and, and Rangham and so forth. That's the second piece of the puzzle. And that's a way of articulating this idea that it's not just, oh, wow, you wound up with culture that can do all this crazy stuff. It's the idea that that then has this effect on biology. That was the second part that took me a long time to grasp. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to take some questions from uh, our online audience next. So um, if we get the mic to Talita at the front, who's okay. selecting questions. Yes, so one of the questions is, would you give us 60 seconds on the third stage that we are living through now and how the driving forces you have been discussing are now being manifested uh, differently? Yes. Um, so I, I alluded to it briefly, uh, but the, the third stage uh, is the development of markets and bureaucracy. Uh, and there's, uh, and you know, you know, obviously there's gigantic literature about the emergence of capitalism, the industrial revolution, why did it happen in Britain, not in China, et cetera, et cetera, right? So again, there's this huge body of scholarship around that. That's actually where most of my work is done in terms of understanding systems of cooperation, the welfare state, uh, the market economy, and so forth. Um, and that's, I think, a very different story. Like, those are, those are innovations that occur within the institutional space. Now, I mean, I guess while I'm at it, I mean, I can mention, seeing as though I'm doing publicity for, for North Wallace and Weingast, I can say their view of the matter um, is to say that the, the innovation is when the state stops enforcing laws because it thinks that those are the way, like, that's the way you should behave and starts using law as a tool, allowing individuals to create their own organizations. So it's also a kind of leveraging of cooperation story. So that's why they call it an open access order. Right? So you think of like corporations, you know, it used to be that like corporations all had to be chartered by an act of parliament. Right? That is, you had, to, you had to go and ask, and if it was good for you to have a corporation, then you would get your corporation, right? And so you know, the crown and parliament would confer upon you the possibility of having a corporation. Whereas then there was a change in development where people, like individuals who wanted to form a corporation, they no longer had to get special permission. You had the creation of corporate law, which allowed it, it created a generic structure. So that anybody who wanted a corporation could just go and say, I'd like to have a corporation. And then the law would say, you know, you now have a corporation, right? And then you cooperate, and if there's conflict, you can then appeal to the law as recourse to solve these kinds of private problems. So that's what they call an open access order. And so they think that that's the, the, the kind of next stage of development. And that also is a kind of a leveraging story, right? So instead of using the law to tell people how to act, right, you're using the law to allow people to create their own cooperative systems where they figure out how to act and they use the law as recourse in that matter. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, can we come down here to the front? 
All right, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about the role of complex systems that have originated mostly in the natural sciences, particularly physics, but also a little bit in economics and biology too, of course. Uh, but I wanted to ask of their, their relevance to this sort of human, human, humanity sort of line of inquiry and also their relevance to the role of the evolution of culture that you had described and to the, the, the line of sociological thought that sort of has originated with some of these works that are on the screen currently because I think that complex systems are a really important aspect of many uh, like systemic things that drive our societies today and drive the natural sciences and our understanding of the universe today. But whether they originated with the, the rise of extremely complicated cities and, and civilizations in the, in the present era, or whether they were also present throughout the history of culture as well is something that I, I wasn't quite sure about and uh, made me think with your talk, so uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I would love to be able to give like enthusiastic thumbs up to complex systems theory, um, but I have to say, you know, that body of work um, over time has been actually a source of incredible mischief in the social sciences um, because it has in, it encouraged, I mean, I don't want to taint by association, but it has encouraged a lot of the fallacies around cooperation um, that people then had to struggle to overcome in the 20th century. Um, and so Parsons's work, for example, I mean, the, that one insight that I kind of plucked out of Parsons um, you know, might have been news to a lot of people because not a lot of people read Talcott Parsons anymore. Uh, and one of the reasons that people don't read Talcott Parsons uh, was that he was actually very impressed by complexity theory, autopoietic systems theory, et cetera, et cetera. And it generated a kind of wild functionalism, right? Where he took um, these, you know, benefits of uh, increased complexity as explanatory of the development of, of increased complexity. Um, and, you know... So violating you know, every structure of methodological individualism in the social sciences. Um, and so the, the genuine insights that are in parts of this philosophy tend to be ignored because 90% of it is, is completely obsolete and unhelpful. Again, because of this kind of uh, functionalism that has subsequently fallen into disrepute. Um, and so you know, like part of the reason game theory was important was because it forced people to adopt the, uh, that, the, the action theoretic perspective. Um, and to think about how does it look from people's interest. And so the fact that we have a collective interest in doing such and such doesn't mean that we are all going to do it, right? Each single one of us actually has to show up to do it, right? And then the question is how do you actually motivate people to do it? Um, so I don't want to rule it out, but I just want to say that it was actually a source of, of a lot of really bad social science of the 20th century. Um, and uh, I got, I'll mention that the, the, the first time I was invited to a conference at the London School of Economics, it was because I actually wrote the article uh, Methodological Individualism in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, and, um, and I tried to give a kind of sort of broad Catholic in the sort of broad non-denominational sense account of methodological individualism and its importance. So I'll refer you to that. Um, it, not to kind of uh, be a proponent of atomism in social science, but just to be a proponent of the importance of always, you know, having to always look at things from an action theoretic perspective. And complexity theory tends to abstract away from that. Thanks. Um, yes, over here um, in, the, in, the, in the blue. Yep. Thank you. That was a really, really interesting talk. So um, my question, I guess, is more related to, to this problematic. So we live in an age of, I think, potential catastrophes all around. We've got nuclear weapons, we've got um, climate-related natural disasters, which are all human-made potential catastrophes and um, events of unprecedented scale and impact. Um, and, as, and, and these will disproportionately affect um, future generation, uh, as well as ours increasingly so. Um, as you said, we can't motivate cooperation historically by showing the obvious benefits, which in our case would be survival of a species. Um, so my question to you is, what kind of underlying conditions or, 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 or system or even the way we conceptual cooperation would we need in order to address the current issue of our civilization, which is um, catastrophes on the one hand and the fact that the burden is disproportionately borne by 
future people. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I would say there's a couple, th I mean, there's a huge number of implications of what I've been presenting. So one of them I think is important is to, is to be able to articulate in a fairly clear and precise way the fragility of civilization and of the systems of cooperation that we rely upon and take for granted. Uh, and in part, it's important to recognize, so while I think that Weingast, Wallace, and North exaggerate somewhat when they say there's only three social orders, they are absolutely correct in saying that the number of, of tricks that have been proven to work uh, in terms of establishing robust systems of cooperation amongst human beings can be counted perhaps on the fingers of two hands, right? That is, is there are not that many tricks that work well. And if you look at the structure of our, of our very complex societies, what you can see is that we've picked up on the few tricks that do work and that we've leveraged them as much as we, like we, that is we work them as hard as we can, right? Um, that's obviously very important when it comes to thinking about, about human progress and about uh, possibilities of change and improvement is to recognize that we can't just kind of like make up stuff and, um, and hope it works, right? That we're, we, we actually are subject to a huge number of constraints. Um, but then also specifically with respect to cooperativeness, we lack the, as uh, the way Andy Clark would put it, we don't have the onboard resources to sustain the level of cooperation that we currently enjoy, right? That is thrown back upon our, you don't want to say innate endowment, but our kind of basic skills as human beings, our innate endowment plus our cultural and social skills, right? We don't have what it takes to sustain this kind of complex cooperation, right? We have, we have what it takes in terms of our onboard resources, we have what it takes to maintain a foraging order, right? But we're the beneficiaries of this long history of, of cultural and social evolution that has allowed us institutionally to develop certain kinds of tricks that then allow us to exceed our programming, as it were, right? So that civilization, as I once put it, is kind of a, a collection of kludges, right? That is, it's, it's, a, it's a, a collection of institutional workarounds to the limitations of human nature, right? Um, and so it's clearly vulnerable to collapse. Right? Because you know, if it stops working, it's not like we could all just get together and reconstruct it, right? Um, just kind of get together in a room and work it out. The way, for example, like social contract theorists thought you could do that. So I think it's helpful at, at sort of helping one to see the fragility of, of civilization as, a, as a, an accomplishment. That's why I have a kind of like, I, I actually think the collapse literature is super interesting and highly relevant. Uh, to the circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, on, on the other hand, with respect to specific challenges, it is important to recognize, though, that it's all predicated upon a kind of reversal of certain kinds of expectations. Right? So if you look at dialogue around, for example, global warming, there is still sometimes, um, you know, and often outside of, of, of academics and social scientists, this kind of expectation that we should just all be able to get together and solve it. Right? Um, so like, you know, global warming is bad, we would be better off if there weren't global warming. So we should just stop, right? Like, that, like that's, that's the benefits of cooperation explain cooperation idea, right? And a lot of environmentalists think that, right? Like, they're, oh, there has to be something wrong with us, right? So to the extent that we're not solving it, it must be because, you know, there's some nefarious intervention like fossil fuel companies or, you know, tricking, or whatever, whatever, right? Um, but no, it could just be we're failing. Right? Like we're just failing to cooperate. You know, and if you look out the window, you can see a lot of failures of cooperation in nature, right? Like cats eating mice and stuff like that, right? So like, like the baseline is that you get failures of cooperation. Um, and we've evolved all these tricks or, and developed culturally all of these tricks to, to allow us to expand our system of cooperation. But there are very few circumstances in which we've actually been able to cooperate on a global scale using state-like regulatory devices. Right? So fixing the problem of global climate change requires that all humans cooperate using something like regulatory devices. And it's not something that humanity has ever accomplished before. Right? So there's no a priori reason to think that it's doable. Um, so we should try, right? But like the burden of proof is reversed, right? Like the, um, there's, so the only productive thing is to say, look, like, but you don't need to have a conspiracy theory to explain why it's not happening. The, the reason it's not happening is, is because it's, it's, it's demanding of us cooperation on a scale that we've never previously achieved, right? So it's a big ask of humanity. Um, great. I think there's loads of questions along the front here. So can we come to Alex in the middle? Thank you very much for such a stimulating lecture. My question is a 
why in this story you haven't appealed to one, you talked about conformism, but what about in a broad sense, the development of a moral sense, which is, you know, conformism sounds a bit pejorative, moral sense sounds perhaps a bit idealistic, but what I have in mind is a story that might fit with what you indicate, which is the one roughly which was articulated by Mandeville, then Hume, and Adam Smith, this idea that our capacity for sympathy, which you already indicated, is clearly present in, from birth, or close to birth, very young children, is what we work on you know, we each, we, you work on a child's sense of themselves and how they will be judged by praising, blaming, encouraging, discouraging, and so on, and their ability to form, so to speak, a, the, as Hume called it, a judicious spectator, which, which takes a kind of impartial perspective on themselves, but it's not a mere uh, device, we also, through our sympathy, begin to feel along with what other people feel about us. This is, we judge ourselves as, uh, ourselves as others through this moral device will judge us. So that becomes a very important human motive on this account. I wondered where you thought it, it, it featured in the development of human sociality. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think the answer, the first answer to that is, is also in Hume, which is um, sympathy is great, but it's limited. Um, and so the natural virtues are lovely, um, but the thing about sympathy is that it's limited in its scope. And that's what evolution leads us to expect, which is that sympathy and empathy uh, evolved undoubtedly through a system of sort of kin selection. Um, and because of the free rider problems that arise in biological systems, they necessarily have to be limited in scope, which is why we tend to experience greater sympathy when we're looking at someone directly in the face, not anonymous strangers on the internet, it's why people who resemble us more are more likely to exhibit sympathy and so forth. It has all the hallmarks of something which is, is the product of kin selection. Um, and, and Hume himself recognized that the natural virtues must be expanded with the artificial virtues, right? And the artificial virtues are ones where we develop cooperative systems based on a rational insight that there's benefit to be had. So promise keeping, property, and so forth. The mechanism that Hume appealed to uh, was reciprocity in sustaining that, dyadic reciprocity between individuals. And so the first blush of enthusiasm for sociobiology in the 1980s was based on sort of Wilson and Trivers and so forth, who thought that they could use that mechanism of reciprocity to then explain uh, heightened prosociality amongst humans. So that you have a sympathy mechanism that you often see all over the place in the animal kingdom that's obviously important for humans because our, our offspring are so dependent on us. Um, and then you, get, you could get a kind of amplification of dyadic reciprocity, and that could explain human society. So then a very, very important development in all this, again due to Boyd and Richardson, is the recognition that, but a bunch of game theorists like Gintis and stuff like that as well, made important contributions in recognizing that that kind of reciprocity also can't explain the scope of human uh, sociality. And so this is like, I'll just say, like the ba major problem with Franz Duval's work uh, on chimpanzees and chimpanzee politics is what he showed was that chimpanzees are actually incredibly good at that kind of dyadic reciprocity. Um, and so the kind of stuff that Hume was describing as the foundations of the artificial virtues, uh, chimpanzees are also perfectly capable of. And yet, chimpanzees are not capable of advanced sociality. They can't sustain troops larger than about 80 to 100 individuals. Right? So basically, this is what is often a blind sight in Duval's work. He doesn't recognize that everything that you find in chimpanzees rules it out as an explanation of what's going on with humans. Right? Because we don't see like a chimpanzee run Heathrow or whatever, right? <laughs> so obviously that kind of reciprocity is not important enough. Right? So Buddy Richardson did some modeling to show that what you need, so the, the specific puzzle with humans is to explain large scale cooperation amongst genetically unrelated individuals, a not dyadic corporation. So, you know, you can get friendship out of that, but you can't get society out of that. So, how do you get? The large-scale cooperation with strangers is the, the puzzle. And conformity, then, is an account of that. Um, Self-domestication could have subsequently created some of the stuff that we associate with the moral sense. But my inclination is to think that it's not sympathy. So I think sympathy is hugely overrated. Right? It's actually the anxiety you feel when everyone in the room is doing something and you're not. That, so, which is a funny way of saying I'm a Kantian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have another question from online? Could we get a mic to Talita? 
Okay, uh, we have another one online, uh, which is, it is not all clear to me whether there is something like a strong religious class in many more liberal and secular contemporary cultures. What, if anything, plays the role of steering norms and determining ritual in these societies? And should we understand the decline of this religious class as a pronouncement of impending collapse? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, so I, I, I mean, I, the, all the online people want to talk about the open access order. Um, that, uh, I, you know, the, so I'm kind of like a, a Durkheim fan on this stuff. Um, that is, the, um, the trifunctional order is, um, uh, you know, designed um, to, to, I mean, whatever. I mean, it has a certain level of scalability in terms of the kind of society that it can sustain. And as we see, it's vulnerable to collapse in various ways. One of the things about the natural state order is that it requires high levels of value consensus and therefore intensive socialization practices and a pretty punitive legal order. Um, and, uh, and it generated intuitions in the 18th century and 19th century where, you know, <laughs> like you think of the, the stuff that we teach all the time about social contract theory and attitudes towards religion, right? I mean, most of the social contract theorists, despite being proponents of religious tolerance, they all just assumed that there had to be a state religion. Uh, so, you know, Rousseau, for example, thought, I mean, Hobbes thought, you, you had to have a state religion. Why? Because you couldn't possibly have a society hang together without a shared religion. So they just wanted to have like a kind of neutered version, like a boiled down to basics Christianity, but they still thought there should, you know, something like a church of England, that, there's, that they thought there had to be a state religion though, right? Um, and then it's sort of a discovery uh, of the maybe 20th century that you actually don't, you can actually get along fine without a state religion, it turns out, right? Now, I actually think that one of the, one of the reasons for that is that the, the market actually allow, re, allows you to reduce the level of functionally required value consensus in the society. That is, the, mar the, the market, and to a certain extent the bureauc bureaucracies, but the market is kind of so good at integrating and generating a division of labor that you can allow people to actually have greater divergence with respect to their values. So I do believe that um, mammon ultimately proves to be the enemy of, of the true faith. Um, by, like the market actually sort of reduces the need for religious consensus. And that's why many contemporary societies are able to get along without a single religion or a shared religion, but also without so much uh, priestcraft. Great, Thank I think we've got time for one more question. Let's uh, come down to the front again here. Yeah. Keep it brief. Um, you talked about these three eras, and my question was, would it have been possible for someone living in the first or second era to conceive of these, the future eras? And is there any reason to believe that the third era that we live in will be the last one, or could there be a fourth? <laughs> and what might it look like? Yeah, my, my, th my, th my thought is that it would be ex extremely difficult um, to conceive of, of the, the further order. Um, in part, I mean, partly because of the, you know, the absence of, of a sociology in, in Kant's sense of the term, right? Like, we don't understand uh, how social order works. So we all enjoy the benefits of complex civilization, but push comes to shove. Like, we don't know how it works, like what it is exactly that we're doing, right? So there's a sense in which we're all, I mean, just by the nature of cultural transmission, kind of conservatives in various domains, right? Where for the most part, we reproduce practices and we try to generate slight improvements where we can, right? But most of it is, is a product of imitation and the reproduction of institutions that deep down, we don't really know how they work. And so if we were to be wiped in our memory of how we'd made them, we wouldn't be able to reconstruct it. Um, and, so the, and so much of it, I think, is unintuitive and very, very mysterious. And so we don't have good social science. And that, I mean, getting back to, to Colt's plan about the improvement of humanity and progress, it makes it very, very difficult to achieve progress other than just incrementally, right? Because we can dream up all kinds of schemes that would be better, um, but then we try to implement them and they don't work. Uh, and we don't really understand why they don't work. It's just that everybody's fighting and, and, and no one's cooperating. Um, and so the things that do work are often really unintuitive. And often, like, say, the market seem really morally counterintuitive to people as well. And so, like, I, I would say that, you know, I mean, that's why sort of, you know, utopian social planning is really difficult. <laughs> um, uh, because we don't understand, like, we're trying to move forward, 
And we're clearly subject to a huge range of constraints, psychological, social, biological, and we don't know what the constraints are. And, and yet we're trying to move forward, right? And that puts us in a really, really difficult position. And on that optimistic note, <laughs> uh, that's, that's all we have time for. I know there were loads more questions that people wanted to ask, but I'm afraid we we're out of time. Um, so thank you very much, Joe. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming. Thanks to our wonderful event staff who've, uh, who've been great today and to the School of Public Policy and the Department of Philosophy for uh, sponsoring this event. Thank you.